Our Heavenly Father, once again, we say thank you so much for the blessings of the Sabbath. And uh, our prayer is that uh, we may dwell at the feet of Jesus Christ. And Lord, get the nourishment that we need. And uh, your holiness will, may go with us. And uh, you may continue instructing us. Thy blessings be upon us. And as we look into this subject, may you continue speaking to us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, happy Sabbath and welcome wherever you are tuned in. And we praise the Lord for taking us through the week and uh, showering us with his blessings. We are seeing some drops of the rain, some drizzling. And we believe that the Lord will want to do something special to us, not only on the physical land, but also to our spiritual nature so that uh, we may be able to understand his will. We may be able to seek his face and uh, walk in his statutes. Uh, I'd like to welcome us to this uh, evening uh, presentation. And uh, I hope that uh, you will be blessed and uh, the Lord will continue uh, speaking to us individually and corporately and as a church of uh, the things that uh, he will want us to do. And so I wanted to speak about uh, uh, dealing with the differences. How, how do we deal with the differences we have? And more so when... Uh, Satan is trying to unite his army all over the world. Christ prayed for his church to be united so that it may fulfill his purpose of spreading the message to the whole world. And so I tend to look at uh, the book of Acts. And uh, it is a book that uh, we have been studying for a while now as a family and uh, looking uh, into those things that uh, really uh, involve us in this time that we're living in. When you look at uh, the book of Acts, we find the disciples receiving what we call the early rain, but uh, that early rain was only received as uh, the children of God were, answer, were, were gathered having an upper room experience. And uh, what were they going through at that time when uh, the early rain came to them or the former rain? They were studying the sanctuary and the prophecies that uh, related to the son of God, his suffering, his life, his suffering, his death and an atonement for us. and. Um, while Christ was with them, the disciples, um, th there was so much controversies. There was so much um, differences that they had uh, when they were with Jesus Christ. But now Christ had died and had resurrected and had gone to heaven. And now they had to put their act together and start asking themselves um, what was the real important thing at that moment. They had been struggling for positions. They had been struggling for supremacy. Who will be the first? Who will be this and that? But now that thing was lost unto them when they gathered into unto the room, upper room. And uh, we see them studying the Old Testament prophecies. We see them studying uh, the sanctuary. You can find Stephen relating these things to the church that was gathered, uh, uh, to, 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 to the Jewish who uh, were gathered. You can also see Peter narrating all this stuff to do with Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God and coming and dying for the nation of Israel. It was not until they had done that that the early rain came. The differences they had when Christ was there seemed to have gone and there was no differences. The only thing they wanted to know is Christ and Christ him alone who was crucified and not only crucified, but uh, resurrected. And so 
uh, I believe that uh, the things that happened under the the outpouring of the early rain are things that the Lord is seeking to to happen in us before the latter rain is poured out. For we are told in Ecclesiastes chapter one verses nine that uh, there is nothing new under the sun and. Uh, in 3.15, we are told that uh, what has been is what shall be and God required of the history. Let us look at these disciples. What were they doing as we look at this theme of uh, dealing with differences? In Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, we are told, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, this, this is so important. When, when, when we read such a things, there's something that uh, comes to our attention. Are we walking together? Are we walking house to house, breaking bread together? Are we continuing in the spirit of the former rain to bring in the latter rain, or we have deviated from that experience? And what we need is a whole new experience. Are we looking for something so new, or uh, we have to look into what has been and see how successful it was, and instead of trying to improve on the methods that succeeded, align with those methods so that Christ may work in us the way he worked in those who were able to live through those times. Um, have we studied enough the differences that uh, the disciples had and how they were able to put them aside so that uh, they may be able to win souls unto Christ? Rather than uh, continue creating conflict of interest and kingship and lordship over each other, how do these people deal with the differences and how do we have to deal with uh, our own differences that are so many amongst us? Um, in the book of, uh, in the division of Psalms 119, 165, let me bring this in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we read this in uh, the division of Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. But again, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Have we tried our best to be peacemakers in the whole scenario where the whole world is getting divided? You, you see, some people will say that. Uh, uh, disunion and uh, splits and separation must take place because they have been prophesied that uh, truth will divide people and uh, there shall be a whole wheat and a whole tear, one on the other side and the other on the other side. But um, there seems always to be an imbalance in approaching things when we talk about uh, there shall be splits until the end of the time and the uh, truth shall continue separating the people. Yes, the truth shall continue separating people because light has no fellowship with darkness. But then to find the people are seeking for that uh, separation, disunity and split, that does not fall under what the Bible says that uh, darkness and the light shall not uh, be together. Always speaking about disunity, always speaking about separation. This is not what the Lord calls us to do. He calls us to, in fact, Jesus' last prayer in John 17 is that uh, we may be one as even the Father and the Son are one. But um, I think uh, we have gone overboard in dealing with the differences and uh, magnifying things rather than trying to see which points can we be together and uh, it will not cause us to have a deformed character. In the whole scenario of things, 
at the end of the day, as much as doctrines are good, what is going to get people to heaven is a right character with God. Now, somebody will challenge me. Uh, John 17, 17 says that sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. And so error does not sanctify. I'm not talking about uh, people entertaining error and defying truth and arguing and debating about it. I'm talking about uh, allowing people to grow together and uh, giving them time to be able to see things uh, the way the Bible says that they should see them. Other than uh, forcing us, forcing them into seeing things the way we see them. And then uh, trying to advance more faster than the others. You know, we are told that advancing more faster and then procrastinating, all those two are not good. There seems to be a, a line in between there where actually there is forbearance, there is um, being able to be patient with those uh, whom the souls you are dealing with. Uh, you, you look at Jesus Christ. Nowadays, we cannot be with somebody for three years who differ with us. Somebody who doesn't understand the way we reason out and the way we speak things. Barely you'll find somebody saying, I'll persevere with this brother for three years. I'll persevere with him for two or such like years. Today, you meet somebody, you give him some information or you give her some information they seem like they don't agree with it or they are not understanding and they tell you, no, I, I, I don't see things the way you see them. I, I think I cannot accept this for now. And then you say that and then, okay, then uh, I have nothing to do with you. And uh, if uh, you can't believe the way I believe, then, uh, okay, that is it. Uh, you go your way, I go my way, we, we shall meet in heaven. So I don't know which heaven is this that we are going to meet if uh, we shall not meet on earth. And it is probable that we will not meet on earth and yes, meet, meet, meet in heaven. But uh, the, the way we put things is like uh, dismissing somebody. It's like an irony that uh, if you make it to heaven, I'll be surprised. And uh, that, that, that is how we deal with our differences. Today, we have a difference. And uh, the next minute, we are not really together and we are ready to denounce, we are ready to accuse, we are ready to condemn. And um, I don't think uh, even when John Mark and uh, Paul differed, uh, they had to go to such an extent. So think about it. Mind, character, and personality, volume two, page 423, paragraph three. It is the Lord's plan that there shall be unity in diversity. There is no man who can be a criterion for all other men. Our varied trusts are proportioned to our varied capabilities. I have been distinctly instructed that God endows men with different degrees of capability and then places them where they can do the work for which they are fitted. Each worker is to give his fellow workers the respect that he wishes to have shown himself and so you know our minds don't run in the same channel like uh, you can bear with me there have been medical conditions where we have slow thinkers and we have quick thinkers and uh, i cannot say this deformity of the mind is from the lord but also i can say this that uh, the lord has allowed some things to happen in the lives of some other people to test our character, how we can deal with such a people. And uh, every now and then it seems like uh, we are failing the test because we have to have people think like us. We have to have them run at our pace. But uh, forgetting that uh, each one of us has a work to do and uh, we may be of different characters, we may be of different nationalities, but uh, at the same point we are one in Christ. And so if we allow our peculiarities of character and disposition to separate us here, how can we hope to live together in heaven where we are telling somebody, okay, you have differed with me. I think I cannot work with you. And uh, all, all, all we can do, let, let us meet in heaven. Think about how our words come out. Think about uh, the impression that it leaves to the other people. 
And uh, I, I don't uh, play the part of a saint because I have been involved in this in some respect. And I'm trying to think the thing over about it. And remember, I'm not talking about um, ecumenism, where actually let us forget everything about doctrine and let us move along. I'm also not talking about tolerance where actually people have to sin and they are excused. No one can say anything because it will come out as if you are judging the motives and the morals of somebody when you can't read their hearts. No, we are not talking about tolerance where sin has now to be covered and no one says something because they fear hurting feelings. We are not talking about ecumenism where people can believe what they want to believe, teach what they want to believe, and then we say that we are moving along, along because Christ prayed for unity. I'm talking about how do we deal with those differences? What, what are the options that we have? And uh, First of all, we are told that love covers a multitude of sin. We are to cherish love. We, we can read first, for instance, chapter 13, the whole of it. I can read it in this session. But then go reread it because it's a chapter that we have to continue reading again and again and see if uh, it is agape love compelling us to utter the statements we utter or it's not. Uh, it is out of uh, some pride and selfishness that still exists in us. And so there is to be among us the unity for which Christ prayed in John chapter 17. And uh, that unity is found when all people are striving for eternal life and not for supremacy. When uh, people are trying to see how they can form a character fit for heaven. And, um, you know, the, the Lord of heaven really may impress different minds with the same thought, but it may express it in a different way, yet without uh, contradiction. The, the problem is that uh, some of the things I have seen is that uh, with the brethren, they will want you to speak exact words that they are speaking. This has been another problem in uh, Christendom, that uh, if somebody says a statement or if you have to believe maybe something uh, uh, or a doctrine, th the same way the brother expresses is the same way you, you, you should express it. And you cannot come from a different angle. It uh, brings about suspicion. It brings about um, doubt and uh, People are so cautious, where is this person headed at the end of the day? What is this person trying to bring home? And then you find that alienation. This is um, like uh, the case of Wagoner and Jones and uh, Uriah Smith back in 1880s, where actually Wagoner had to come in with righteousness by faith from a different standpoint and Jones. And uh, Uriah Smith thought that this was something so strange that accepting one aspect of this will lead to accepting another thing. Another thing they were afraid of, which was not even there. You see how you start dealing with the differences that we have. Somebody is coming from another angle and bringing the truth in a more either exalted way or in a more understandable way, the way they understand it. But here you are in this corner and uh, you are thinking about how this thing can be different. You are not really assimilating what is being spoken, but your mind is running in front of what is being presented and thinking how you can catch up a word that will fit in your doubts that what, whatever this person is speaking is error. And so a little deviation from the very words that you expect him to speak or her to speak and they are not spoken, you end up with conclusion, whatever was being presented is something so new, something that uh, is really dangerous. But uh, we are told uh, that um, when, when, you, you, when you read uh, what uh, our sister White says that uh, uh, in, uh, 1SM, uh, in 1SM page 22, that uh, it is seldom that two persons will view and express truth in the very same way. 
each can dwell on particular points which he, his constitution and education has fitted him to appreciate the sunlight falling upon the different objects give those objects a different uh, hue. But you may speak of that truth and it comes out with a different hue also. And to argue about, I, I think that you could have put it like this. I think that um, it was not sounding as it should be. No, that is not how to deal with the different brothers and sisters. I think uh, it is um, wanting people to be mere reflectors of uh, what you believe and what you preach. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, we are told, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same spirit. And so to try and uh, fix people in a box that uh, they might have these sentiments and these phrases and all that, really, that is not in the will of God. Think about a pastor and an evangelist and a teacher in the, in the church of God. And uh, they are speaking on John 3.16. And we also have a theologian speaking about John 3.16. You will find a pastor dwelling much more uh, maybe on the uh, love of God and um, uh, how the church should uh, really cultivate love for one another. An evangelist will go on and talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and how we have to sacrifice to reach other people. We are talking about John 3.16. And uh, you will find a teacher there trying to bring about um, the verbs and the adverbs and all that uh, in uh, his session. And... Uh, trying to bring out the aspect that love has the end, end result, which is to give. You will have in the same room a theologian who will go into Greek and Hebrew and talk about what begotten means and um, uh, the ontological reality of the matter. And so here you have four people speaking about John 3.16, and they are coming from different angles. And for you to rise up and say that a pastor should have said what uh, an evangelist said, a theologian should have said what a teacher said. You know, sometimes we get into this semantics and then they create these differences. And uh, or after creating this, and then there's a lot of tension and the atmosphere is charged. And then uh, there's this battle that... Uh, I think the person was trying to hide the reality of John 3.16. And so this is how things rise up every now and then. And then uh, you find that uh, brethren cannot even talk together because um, somebody will ask you, why did you say, why didn't you say this and this? Uh, continuing to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, we are told, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another designing of spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But uh, all this worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of, the, of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. And so to bring about these differences and uh, uh, to think that uh, everyone has to really be under or reflect your thoughts uh, is a uh, pride that uh, really has not died in our lives. And uh, 
there is the issue of uh, you understand John. John saw another person working and it was not in the methods that uh, maybe they were working with. And then he told Jesus Christ, I saw somebody casting out demons in your name, but he is not with us. And I stopped him. And Christ told, told him and rebuked him that uh, really, that, that is not what it should. In fact, Jesus tells John that uh, whoever is not against us is for us. He doesn't tell him whoever is not with us is not of the kingdom. Now, I know there are differences that are there, and uh, we really strive so much for gospel order and organization and discipline, which is a very vital point if we shall be able to finish the work in this end times. The angels of heaven are um, organized in their work, and we need to get organized in the work. The, the, the main reason for organizing is that uh, we may be accountable to what we are doing. We may avoid confusion like Babylon. Think about this. One ministry is doing um, a gospel campaign in maybe uh, one area, and uh, they believe the same doctrine. And uh, another group also wants to do a gospel campaign in that area. Now, will we have two tenths of the people who believe the same thing proclaiming the message and inviting? the congregants in their church. Think about that. We may be not of one ministry, but we are of one belief, and then we abruptly find ourselves in one town. If there were gospel order, organization and discipline, then that is simple to solve. But if there is no gospel order, organization and discipline, that is where you find that uh, one ministry, We'll go ahead. Those who have powerful PA system will go ahead and do their meeting. While those who have weaker PA system, then they'll be like muted. And or also that um, one ministry will say, okay, let us not do it. But after they have gone, let us do our meeting. That, that is also not uh, wise. I, I, I don't know how people are. Uh, Think about these things and uh, take them in the heart. And so we should look into these things. But also I want to bring this one. On the other hand, the leaders among God's people are to guard against the danger of condemning the methods of individual wor workers who are led by the Lord to do a special work that but few are fitted to do. Let brethren in responsibility be slow to criticize movements that are not in perfect harmony with their methods of labor. Let them never suppose that every plan should reflect their own personality. Let them not fear to trust another's methods, for by withholding their confidence from a brother laborer who, with humility and consecrated zeal, is doing a special work in God's appointed way, they are retarding the advancement of the Lord's course. 9259.1. We need to cultivate um, trust. We need to cultivate brotherly love. You, you know, we talk about the Philadelphian condition and uh, we thirst for it every day, but uh, we don't work uh, for it. Most, uh, most so we are far pulling up away from it rather than seeking it. And so you'll find that uh, instead of um, maybe these two ministries who ha which have met in one field, instead of uh, looking at the greater, the greater thing, which is to win souls, the, the very first point that comes into their minds, or oh, we differ on this, or we differ on this, then uh, let, let these people finish, and then we who, we who think that we are so right, we will come in with our message. This is the attitude. We shall come with the real message. By the way, you may be having those true doctrines and lacking character and people will just look at you with your doctrines and say, are, are these people serious really? All of them are Seventh day Adventists, but uh, look at what is happening. We don't want this confusion that happens with ch Sunday churches that uh, 
People are here, Sunday church is here doing its crusade today. It finishes this afternoon and in the evening we have another Sunday church there doing its crusade. Brethren, we, we should be so much sure than that. We should go beyond what the Sunday churches actually do. And uh, think how this hurts Christ. And so the first impression that people will have, those who will be in that area is that, oh, there, there are several Seventh-day Adventist church, which is not a bad thing for people to think, but uh, the first impression on the minds of the people doesn't really go well with them. Uh, and uh, it, it's not uh, edifying at all. It's not edifying at all for people to get the first impression that they have variances among these people. It will be better for you even to postpone that thing that you want to do and let the other people do. And so brethren should not be having so much time to dwell on the differences they have. For Christ's sake, we should go on our knees and uh, pray to God and ask him to give us a clean heart. And uh, in General Conference Bulletin, March 30, 1903, we are told that uh, labor in harmony with one another, even though you are not alike. I'll try and uh, bring this on. Brethren and sisters, we have no time to dwell on little differences. For Christ's sake, to your knees in prayer, go to God and ask him to give you a clean heart. Ask him to help you stand where he wants you to be. Labor in harmony with one another, even though you are not alike. Do you not know that of the leaves on a tree, there are no two exactly alike? From this, God will teach us that among his servants, there is to be unity in diversity. So I'm just uh, praying the Lord that uh, he, he may work on our characters. He may work on our characters because it is uh, so important in the times that you're living in to have a uh, a character fit for heaven than uh, to have doctrines without characters. It is alarming how people are uh, really concerned with doctrines, which are so good, but uh, no one is concerned with the character that is fit for heaven. And so we have been able to be like uh, I say, the devil himself who knows a lot of doctrines and trembles, but he will not be in heaven. So let us think about these things. In our conversations, what are we to bring in our conversations, in our daily conversations? We should be thinking of uh, bringing all the pleasantness in the message in our lives so that uh, our minds may not dwell on the rubbish and be occupied by that rubbish. You know, think about the spirit of debating and arguing. And uh, I'm not talking about discussions and brethren meeting together to try and examine a text in the spirit of heaven. I'm talking about... Uh, being involved with debates and uh, arguing and condemnations. You know, we argue these things until we are possessed with the spirit of argument and debates, and uh, the same is carried into the family. You may think that uh, you are so immune after knowing doctrines, now you can debate successfully and argue successful about them. Whatever you have partaken is the spirit of debate and the spirit of argument. And uh, if you want to know this is true, just go back and see how you deal with your family. And you, you will understand the very resentment you have for the people outside there is the same resentment you will have at the family level. And uh, these things we speak by experience. That uh, whenever you are getting involved in this thing day and night, that is the very spirit you carry to the family. Praise the Lord, maybe 
you involve yourself in it and you are not married and all that stuff. So you will argue all the day on social media and debate and then you go to your house and you are there alone. And so you think you are okay. But let now somebody join, in, join you in your house, be married or uh, uh, get married to somebody. And then you, you will see that uh, the, the spirit of contention is what you have really uh, possessed because uh, even in the little things that you will find that you are having differences. Um, do not say, this is a general conference bulletin, March 30, uh, 1903, paragraph 35. Let us look at this. Do not say that because your brethren differ with you in some particular, you cannot stand by their side in service. They do not differ with you any more than you differ with them. You know, when we differ with somebody, we think that they have differed with us. And that is the position we take, the, the position of I. Oh, somebody has done this for me. Somebody has done this and somebody has done this. They do not differ with you as much as you differ with them. They, there is no way somebody can differ with you without you differing with them. And so as you take in the fact that somebody has differed with me, are you taking in the fact that I have also differed with somebody? Do you go back and examine even in our differences? This is how my tone came out. This is how my word came out and all this stuff. Or we are just of the idea somebody has differed with me. And we can explain well how they differed with us. But then we can't even explain how we differed with them ourselves. And so it's something to think about also that uh, these things are happening. And so while uh, Christ is praying in John 17, he says that uh, neither pray I for this alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And then we see the early rain experience happening. And uh, we, we find the disciples putting their differences aside in the upper room. And then uh, what really preoccupied their mind at that time? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what kind of power attended to that message, the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, Paul says that if Christ has not resurrected from the dead, then we are still in our sins. And so this gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that permeated the whole Christendom for seven years, even before Paul's conversion. And thousands and thousands were being converted. And then Paul comes in and he says that no creature under the heaven has not heard the word of God. How is it that that word was going so fast? The only doctrine about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet now we have a very solemn message, the investigative judgment going on in heaven. And then we, we, we will want to dissect it into so many things that uh, at the end of giving the message of investigative judgment or atonement that is going on, the merits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, somebody at the end of the sermon wonders, what was the person really speaking? And uh, somebody tries catching up with what you are speaking you have jumped into this topic, you are gone into this topic, and you are gone into this, and then you are back to apostasy, and that is happening amongst us, and the errors of GC, and the errors of that ministry, and this. At the, and you are talking about atonement of Jesus Christ in heaven, and on Calvary. And uh, you are talking about how we can get these merits and efficacious power in our lives. And you spend there like one hour, two hours, two and a half hours, trying just to speak. And the people are listening and they're trying to catch up with what you're speaking, but they're not getting it. Because the, the very motive of you bringing out that subject, it's not for the people 
to be able to grasp the victory that is found in having Jesus Christ in our lives. Having the power of God working in us and for us. What you want to bring out is the aspects of maybe the things you know, rather than what you would like the people to know about Jesus Christ and what Christ would like the people to understand about him. And so, at the end of the sermon, we ask ourselves, after all has been said and done, so what about it? What about those who are lambs? Re remember when Jesus Christ is sending out Peter and giving the commission to the disciples, he says, go and feed my lamb. It means that there are still others who are uh, under age in a spiritual journey. All they need to hear is that Jesus died for you and you can overcome what you are going through. If you give all your hopes to him, he is able to present before you before the father in a spotless way. Whatever thing that you are struggling in, you can trust in him. I look up unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Those are the lambs that are there and they are trying to get something they can hold on to. Somebody is struggling with this and this. And then he says, feed the sheep among you. There are things which are given to the sheep. They, they can never be given to the lambs. Who shall you teach knowledge and who shall you teach doctrine? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. There are those who are weaned out of the breast, those who are not still on the milk. But then you get this congregation, you don't know their disposition, you don't know their character, you don't know how people perceive things and deal with things. And then you can just spit everything into their ears until names are mentioned, names are mentioned, and then uh, someone will meet that somebody one day and say, oh, this is the person somebody was speaking about. And so, they have the, the moment the minister introduces his name, um, Sam Wilberforce, and uh, I come from this place and this place and say, Did I hear somebody mention that name somewhere? And in which context was it mentioned? The mind of the person has been pulled from the message to the person having the message. And that is how we deal with the differences. In that, even this vessel, however impure it may be, at the end of the day, you know what happens? It shall never, this person will never be benefited with this message because he's, he's already grappling with this thought. This is the man with error. This is the man with falsehood. And yes, people will tell you, did uh, Paul talk about uh, Alexander, the coppersmith? Did he not speak about Janice and Jambres? Did he not speak about uh, Hymenaeus? Uh, you know, we take uh, exclusive uh, 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 instances uh, or, uh, and we make them so prominent because Paul did this and this, now I'm at liberty to do this and this. We take it as if it is, uh, a normal duty to speak about this and this, and to mention this and this. But uh, let love be without dissimulation. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 12, this is what we read. However much you differ with somebody, try to avoid mentioning their names, unless it is a must and for a good reason, that although you will leave the people with the name of somebody, also you can leave them with an impression that you are very motive or your very mission was not to injure somebody's reputation. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. This is the kind of attitude everyone of us should be in. We are living in uh, end times where 
every kind of wind will hit us. Not just the winds of doctrines, but um, the winds of even character assassination. And uh, we have to be sure that uh, we are not the guilty part. We, we have just to be sure that uh, we are not the guilty part. Look at uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own concepts. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. What if uh, all... Um, the leaders of the ministries will take this in heart. I think uh, we will see the sins like those of uh, the Wesley's period happen among us. That uh, at the time they, there was a sharp disagreement and there seemed to be a possible alienation, God reminded them that uh, he has not sent them to the world to be able to disagree, but to work for the souls which are lost. Romans chapter 12, verses 18, we read, if it is possible, or if it be possible, as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If there he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We have reached a point in time where even those who differ cannot give each other water to drink without any suspicion among themselves. And uh, this is seen or uh, this is deemed as uh, persecution from unlike brethren. This is taken in as I'm suffering because of Christ. No, you are not suffering of Christ. You are suffering out of your own selfishness. 1888 messages, page 168.3. <clears throat> The debating spirit has come into the ranks of Sabbath keepers to take the place of the spirit of God. They have placed finite men where God should be, but nothing can suffice for us but to have Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. The truth must be the, the truth must become ours. Christ must be our savior by an experimental knowledge. We should know by faith that it is to have our sins pardoned and to be born again. We must have a higher, deeper wisdom than man's to guide us amid the perils surrounding our pathway. The spirit of Christ must be in us just as the blood is in the body, circulating through it as a vitalizing power. And uh, I think uh, much of the, these debates have killed the spirituality of men. And we understand that a house divided cannot stand. And uh, when Christian contend, Actually, it is the joy of Satan who comes in and takes control. And uh, you know, Satan has studied us so much for over 5,000 years. Let me say even 6,000 years, Satan has been studying us so closely. And uh, he knows the buttons to pull. So as even just something so small, it is magnified into a mountain. And now no one can climb it. The person who started it and the other person who is on the other side. Now here is the person who started it. He is on this side. He has created a mountain between himself and the other person. And this person is on the other side. He himself cannot climb the mountain. The other person on the other side cannot climb the same mountain. And you wonder, really, what is happening? And the same people say, okay, let us meet in heaven. Now, what if heaven was at the top of that mountain? You can climb it. You are on this side. 
He is on the other side, he can climb it. And the heaven itself is at the top of that mountain. What do you do about it? And so we look at these things and how Satan really divides the house and uh, makes these differences, turns a mole into a big mountain. And then he is able to bring about these fierce controversies and bitterness and hatred. Just a little matter started, becomes something so big. And the hopes of these people ever coming together, now it is impossible between, because a mountain has been created between them two. How many church members have been sown asunder with this? How many, even in family circles, have been made to go through this? And uh, whatever God was trying to put together, you find that man has separated it. God is seldom glorified in this thing. He is seldom in these things. And uh, you look at how uh, Christ behaved with Judas. Instead of trying to push him on the edge, he, he got closer to him. He got closer to him. But adventure that um, including him in his ministry, he may by beholding be changed into the self same character but uh, judas by the way he was lost not because the problem was with jesus but the problem with was judas with himself and the other disciples in as much as they continued to contend the same spirit caught up with judas and judas who could not control things ended up uh, imbibing the very negative side of things, the controversies that the disciples could have every now and then. All of them now, Judas imbibed them. And uh, praise the Lord that others were able to overcome and then uh, they will be in heaven. But Judas will not be there because he preached at a point who could not overcome the very things he had been entertaining in their life. People see the differences that we have and they take sides and they can't have this balance in their lives and they are shoved off the cliff. They fall on the other side. And so, although discussions can always not be avoided, people who love to see opponents compart may clamor for discussion. Others who have a desire to hear the evidences on both sides may urge discussion in all honesty of motive, but whenever discussions can be avoided, then let them be avoided if you are not sure whatever you are going to speak is going to benefit the souls present. Our words don't have to be the offense of other people. Now, you say that uh, Christ said that I have come to send a sword and fire unto the world and how I wish it had been rekindled. Yes, that is the exact words of Jesus Christ. He says that he wishes that it was rekindled. But then people don't look at the context also, what kind of fire that he's talking about, what kind of sword, the sword of his word. Now, when we apply the sword, which is the word, we can apply it as a, as a butcher or we can apply it as a physician. And so, as even Christ is saying that uh, he is sending out a sword and he's setting, he, 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 he expects or uh, he desires that there should be fire. Christ is having a sword as a physician, not a butcher. Let us not try to read the statements of Jesus Christ and try to get uh, 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 self-protective uh, out of them and bring out meanings which are not there. Christ holds the sword as a physician. He doesn't hold the sword as a butcher. The problem is that when we actually rise up to teach the word of God or preach or to say whatever we want to say, we are holding the word, the same one as a butcher snipe rather than as a shepherd snipe. What if we held it 
as a, a shepherd's knife. The shepherd operates, but to heal. These two people, they cut, they perform whatever they want to perform with their knives. Same thing, different purposes. The butcher will have the knife on your neck to shed blood and to kill you. The physician will have the same knife on your neck, but it is to remove that place that is rotten and then apply the medicine to be able to heal you. But then we see the differences that are existing and then we hold the sword in our hands, not as physicians, but as butchers. A very big difference. Minister of Healing, page 143, says that Christ's method alone will bring true success. He mingled with the people as if he desired uh, to know of their needs, then he supplied their needs and then said, follow me. And that is the true sword. That is how it works. But we hold the sword and we are like, follow me and the other things follow after. That is when I can supply for your need. That is when I can mingle with you. Uh, we have an inverted way of doing things, an opposite way of doing things. In that uh, while Christ starts at the other point, going to the other point, we start at the other point trying to come on the other point. And this is even how we try to deal with the sanctuary message when uh, we meet the people. It is not bad to preach about the most holy message. It is what we should come unto because we are in the day of atonement. But then to meet people and bombard them with how they are going to burn because they have not been Sabbath keepers and all that stuff. To meet somebody who is not dressed well and you say that, you know, you can be dressed like this. You are not uh, really uh, showing the image of a high priest. The, the person doesn't even know that there's something called a high priest by the end, way at the end of the day. The person is just trying to come in terms with this newfound faith. Say, for example, I'm moving from Sunday church to Sabbath church. Never known anything about the sanctuary, never known anything about health reform, and uh, the, the work is to attack rather than to heal. How, how are we dealing with the differences we are having and the problems we are having in churches? Testimonies of the Church, Volume 3, page 425. There are men who have educated themselves as combatants. It is their policy to mistake an opponent and to cover up clear arguments with dishonest quibbles. They have devoted their God-given powers to this dishonest work, for there is nothing in their hearts in harmony with the pure principles of truth. They seize any argument they can get with which to tear down the advocates of truth when they themselves do not believe the things they argue against them. They bolster themselves up in their chosen position, irrespective of justice and truth. They do not consider that before them is the judgment, and that then their ill-gotten triumph with all its disastrous results will appear in its true character. Error with all its deceptive policies, its windings and twistings, and turnings to change the truth into a lie, will then appear in all its deformity. No victory will stand in the day of God except that which truth, pure, elevated, sacred truth shall win to the glory of God. There are men who are educated in being combatants. And uh, it were good if they served in military because the gospel ministry has no, nothing to do with them, by the way. Combatants are in the ministry. Go to the forefront in Afghanistan, go in Iraq, go in Turkey, go in Ukraine. You can do a better job. But uh, in the gospel ministry, yes, we need people who are lost with the full arm of God, not half truths and half reformations to scare people with and all that stuff. We need people who can have balanced mind to leave people with balanced mind. Don't, don't be a person who leaves people perplexed. The work of a gospel minister is not to leave people perplexed. It is to leave the people with the hope in Christ that uh, their salvation. And 
although we have to bring out warnings in clear tones and sound a trumpet with a certain note, it is not our work to scare people from Christ. You, you know, sometimes we paint Jesus Christ with a character that he is none of. And um, yes, sometimes you may go out there and do a very solemn work and uh, come back, give a report. Oh, 20 have been baptized, 30, 40, 50 have been baptized. Even people report a thousand people have been baptized in my gospel campaign. But then why were the people baptized? Only because they feared if Christ came today, they will be burning somewhere. And give them time. You will find that there are thousands that were baptized, only two people are standing. And it is for the sake of the Lord himself, not what you are doing for them, but how the angels are struggling to make sure that they don't get away. And so what does the world conclude with these things that we make on the forefront and we go at each other every now and then? We are told that... Uh, if there is disunion among those who claim to believe the truth, the world will conclude that these people cannot be of God because they are working against one another. When we are one in, with Christ, we shall be united among ourselves. Those who are not yoked up with Christ always pull the wrong way. They possess a temperament that belongs to man's carnal nature and at the least excuse passion is, and at the least excuse passion is wide awake to meet passion. This causes a collision and loud voices are heard in committee meetings, in board meetings, and in public assemblies opposing reform methods. And uh, haven't you really seen this happening amongst the people who are even meeting to discuss certain points of uh, differences? Let us remind, remember that uh, in John, uh, we are told that. Uh, uh, if we love one another, the world will, will know that uh, we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Unity existing among the followers of Christ is an evidence that the Father has sent his Son to save sinners. You want to proclaim the truth about uh, God and his Son and their spirit in a louder voice? Unity existing amongst the followers of Christ is an evidence that the Father has sent his Son. You can proclaim the one true God message as far as you can. Without unity, people will not understand this issue of the Father and the Son. It is incomprehensible. Why is the Father and the Son message so powerful? It is because it shows the love that the Father has for the world and the sacrifice and um, the selfness that... Um, the emptying of self that Christ has. And uh, if this can be demonstrated in this doctrine, then people will see the essence. How is it that the people who are preaching this father and the son are the most divided? It is because they don't comprehend the message itself that they are one. So also they, they must be one. They ought to be one. In... Uh, Testimonies, volume 5, page 119, we are told that uh, 10 members who are walking in all humbleness of mind will have a far greater power upon the world than has the entire church with its present numbers and lack of unity. The more there is of the divided in harmonious element, the less power will, be, will that church have for good in the world. So 10 members united walking in humbleness of the spirit is... Uh, a hundredfold better than a church full of the people whom two cannot even agree on a point. This, this, uh, uh, this state of uh, destitute among us, lack of tenderness, lack of love, lack of sympathy. And then we say that, uh, you know, we are working for God. And truth must come out as pointed as possible. One preacher says that uh, uh,
you must be tactful. And then he asked, can there be attacked without a sharp point? Now it is good when uh, you hear such a statement, is there really attacked without a sharp point? No, there isn't. But then it comes down again to how do we use that sharp object, the sword itself? The sword of the spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, I presume, is the word of God. But is the word of God devoid of tenderness, love, mercy, forbearance, patience, and mutual agreement? Do we want to say that the word of God is tactful and always have a sharp point? And its main sharp point, its main work is just to cause division and disunion and all that. Where is the fruit of the spirit there? And uh, where are these traits and the virtues that comes from drinking of the same flesh and the blood of the son of God? Even in his denunciations on the Jewish people, there was hard that uh, Cry. There was that sobbing, that, that the shedding of tears. Christ says that how I wish I could have gathered you as a hen gathered as her chicks. Now, here is Christ giving a hen element in his ministry. But always the picture we paint is uh, we are the pokerels. Their work is to chase the hens about. Their work is to misuse the hands. Either it gets what it needs or it has none of that. But Christ says, how I wish I will gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. And so many of us cannot fit in the symbol of a hen because our work is not to gather, but our work is to make sure Every person we come into contact with, we put him straight or we scatter him. Now, I'll read you something also interesting, and uh, you can read along with me. We, we count ourselves as reformers, but then reformers are not destroyers. They will never seek to ruin those who do not harmonize with their plans and assimilate to them. Reformers must advance, not retreat. They must be decided, firm, resolute, and flinging, but firmness must not degenerate into a domineering spirit. God desires to have all who serve him firm as a rock where principle is concerned, but meek and lowly of heart as was Christ. Then abiding in Christ, they can do the work he will do were he in the place. A rude, condemnatory spirit is not essential to heroism, in the reforms for this time, all selfish methods in the service of God are an abomination in his sight. Satan works to make the prayer of Christ of none effect. He makes continual efforts to create bitterness and discord. For where there is unity, there is strength, a oneness which all the powers of hell cannot break. All who shall aid the enemies of God by bringing weaknesses and sorrow and discouragement upon any of God's people through their own perverse ways and tempter, tempers are working directly against the prayer of Christ. And so, are we counting ourselves as reformers? Reformers are not destroyers, and their work is not to carry everything negative about other ministries and other people the whole world. How do we treat those who differ with us in doctrine? Evangelism 6, 38.5. We are told, those who differ with us in faith and doctrine should be treated kindly. They are the property of Christ and we must meet them in the great day of final account. We shall have to face one another in the judgment and behold the record of our thoughts, words, and deeds, not as we have viewed them, but as they were in truth. God has enjoined upon us the duty of loving one another as Christ has loved us. Those who differ with us in faith and doctrine should be treated kindly. Now, if uh, I review my past and how I have dealt with those 
who differ with me? Will I be able to stand on the bar of judgment? No, I'll fail. And so I'm looking into this thing again. And you should be looking into it once again, you too. God calls us to awake and not only quote the Bible, quote Sister White and quote the other sources to justify what we are doing, but we should look at the motives of why we are doing what we are doing and what kind of character is it developing, not only in us, but in others and those who look unto us. What kind of impression do we leave upon the people? Why are the churches splitting also? Why? We are not talking about just the leading people in the movements and different ministries. But uh, you come to ask yourself, churches has been, have been established, but why is it that the members of the churches are having differences and they are ready to run in the opposite direction? You are not now talking about leaders, but just the church members. Why is this happening among us? Because the spirit that the leaders have really uh, given to these members. Our church members see that uh, there are differences of opinion among the leading men, and they themselves enter into controversy regarding the subjects under dispute. Christ calls for unity, but he does not call for us to unify on wrong practices. The God of heaven draws a sharp contrast between pure elevating enabling truth and false misleading doctrines. He calls sin and impenitence by the right name. He does not gloss over wrongdoing with the coat of untempered mortar. I urge our brethren to infant upon true spiritual basis. So we are not calling people to unite in error, but to unite in truth. But then to bring these differences before the church until the church imbibe the same spirit and two members of the church cannot even see face to face because they have taken upside. It is not something that the Lord will want us. And then brethren should not feel that it's a virtue to stand apart because they do not see all minor points in exactly the same light. And then uh, one member goes to the pulpit and says this, and another member goes to the pulpit and says this. And then the, the congregation is like, uh, so, so what next? Should we be having a church for this brother? And should we be having a church for this brother? Others don't even wait to cancel together on a particular point before they even share it on the pulpit with the same members of the ministry that uh, they, are, they are working with. They, they, they will only introduce something and other leading brethren in the ministry can only hear it on the pulpit for the first time. I don't think that we are moving in God's direction in these issues. Where is the place of Christ in this? There is no place for Christ. We are told it's only Satan in this. I have been shown that it is the device of the enemy to lead minds to dwell upon some obscure or unimportant point, something that is not fully revealed or is not essential to our salvation. This is made the absorbing theme, the present truth, when all their investigation and supposition only serve to make matters more obscure than before and to confuse the minds of some who ought to be seeking for oneness through sanctification of the truth. And so one brother will introduce this and another will introduce this and be known even amongst themselves. This is what the other brethren believe. And if they could have counseled, then the right platform or the right channel would have been followed. And so, as I try to bring this to an end, how has been our work in the past few years when we came to the truth? Whichever truth that uh, you came unto, how has it been in your life? Have you tried to present Christ or have you tried to present yourself? This is the great issue amongst us and before us. Are we trying to present Christ or are we trying to present what we know to the people? 
there's a big difference in presenting Christ and in presenting what you know. To present Christ is to let him guide you, even if you understand a subject, to leave room for the Holy Spirit to take control of your utterances and your words before a congregation, rather than just having a formulated thing so that um, you may be able to hammer it to the people and uh, bring out all the information you know in this world. How but when the spirit comes, it shall not testify of, of itself, but it shall take that which is for me and give unto you. Now, are we testifying of ourselves or are we taking of what is from Jesus and giving people? We are told, <clears throat> again, Christianity is not manifested in pugilistic accusations and condemnation. First of all, you examine somebody's point so closely. The next thing you are accusing the person and the next thing you are condemning the person. We are told this is not Christianity. And if it is not Christianity, then what it is at the end of the day? You, you may answer what it is. I don't have a right name for it, but uh, we are told that uh, it is not Christianity. And so what should we be seeking at such a time as this? Uh, Psalms 133. Let us revisit Psalms 133 again. And uh, I'll not be able to project, but I, I can just uh, read in your hearing. A song of the grace of David, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hammon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing ever, uh, even life for evermore. And so, right now, Jesus Christ is a high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And uh, he has this oil of gladness trickling from him down to the skirts. This is earth. And uh, there is where the Lord commanded the blessing, even Mount Zion. And uh, when you read Revelation chapter 14, you see 144 standing on Mount Zion. And we are told that there at Mount Zion is where he commands his blessing. It is like the uh, uh, oil flowing from the beard of Aaron, even unto his skirts, which means that the people are standing on Mount Zion as the oil of Aaron is flowing. That is the lamb of God, who is now the high priest. Actually, this um, uh, 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 holy presence permeates their whole being. Think about Moses when he was at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai whichever mountain was that. And he, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights without eating, without drinking. And the glory of the Lord overshadowed him so that when he came out of that place, the people could not behold his face because he was literally shining. Now we are told that when brethren dwell together in unity, it's like the oil, it's the, the ointment on Aaron's beard flowing down to the skirts. It is unto him on unto Mount Zion and that is where the Lord commands his blessings in the 144. Behold, uh, uh, I stood and saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with 144,000 having the Father's name in their forehead, which means that they have received the Spirit of Christ. Christ is indwelling in them, the hope of glory. And so they are receiving this blessing of the latter rain. Will you share in it? Will you stand on Mount Zion? where the Lord commands his blessing? Or will he continue fostering indifference and um, having the sword in your hand, not as a physician, but having it as a butcher? May the Lord God of heaven have mass upon us once again.
as we seek to know and understand his will upon our lives as ministers and gospel workers. May we close up uh, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you once again that uh, you can uh, teach us and so give us a humble spirit. Help us to sit at your feet as even Mary sat there, not to catch up something to condemn you or to catch up something to go and condemn somebody with, but for her own soul and her own salvation. And after getting the glimpses of what you are speaking, she was able to anoint Jesus Christ for his burial, which was a more noble thing. And her name is immortalized in the book. Father, let us be like this woman who sat at your feet. And so thank you for thy spirit and thank you for your gladness in our hearts. Thank you once again for giving us our sins and our shortcomings. Forgive us, Lord, for all that we have moved in the past without knowledge. Having a zeal, but a, a zeal that uh, is like that of Paul before his conversion. Your name be exalted among us. Let us reduce as you increase daily. These things we ask and request in Jesus' name. Amen.